Section Zero of Machine Room Chants. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Newgate Novelist. Machine Room Chants by Tom Maguire. Prefatory Material. Where faster and faster our iron master, the thing we made, forever drives, bids us grind treasure and fashion pleasure for other hopes and other lives. William Morris Tom Maguire Whom the gods love die young, and thus are they ensured of everlasting youth. The idea is full of beauty, were it not that this weary old world so much needs those on whom the gods have bestowed their choicest gifts, that life by their music and mirth may be made endurable. The verses to which these lines are a foreword are not mirth-provoking. They are full as words can be crammed of the tragic pathos of the life of the factory and the workroom. Had Tom Maguire never penned a line, save what is here given, he could have proved his title to take high rank, not only as a poet, but as a deep-sighted student of humanity. He sees things as they are, and, avoiding alike a superficial optimism or morbid pessimism, reveals with the touch of a master the inner workings of the mind of the average working girl, and makes plain much which to the casual observer remains obscure. The socialist movement, none too rich in men who combine a clear wisdom, unerring judgment, and a large, sympathetic heart, could but ill afford to yield back to the gods one gifted young comrade, and yet who had the power to keep him, it is in contemplation to issue a complete collection of his writings, and it is in the belief that what is here given will whet the appetite for more that, in accordance with his original plan, we give to the world his machine-room chants. The profits on the sale will go to his mother, as they would in any case have done had her son been alive. April, 1895. J. Keir Hardy. These chants originally appeared in the Labour Leader, but Tom Maguire always intended that they should be published subsequently as a separate volume. I think many who knew something of our comrade Maguire and his ten years' work for socialism in Leeds and Yorkshire, many too who enjoyed some personal friendship with him, and many who only knew the genial wit and sympathetic touch of Bardolph may value this small book. To me there is a strange pathos in writing these few words for the publication of my friend's first book after his death, his lifelong labours for the people, and his battling with magnificent odds are not ended with his death, and his poetry is not confined within the covers of this book. Leeds, J. Clayton One Sunday in March, Tom Maguire was laid in the cemetery, Leeds. An unusual, almost an imposing, procession of his comrades in Leeds and neighbouring Yorkshire towns followed his body, borne shoulder-high, to the grave, Tears that seldom fall for a mere comrade in political arms wet many and many a cheek. Tom Maguire was one of the small band of men whom the spirit of social revolution called out from amongst the millions of people in this land to first voice the new hope of socialism. His name is affixed, together with that of William Morris and twenty-two others, to the Manifesto of the Socialist League, published in the first number of the Commonweal in February 1895. 
he well knew the humours and the testing struggle of propaganda when all mankind appeared to be against it nowadays when a really noble soul bids us farewell there are no words available to bemoan his loss the currency of which has not been debased upon the tombstone of knaves it has become customary therefore to be silent of praise and endearment when we have much to express and fulsome of flattery and moan when the lies almost stick in our throats this inversion of the natural order of speech matters little perhaps when the dead one has figured greatly before the nation and his deeds good or ill cannot be unsaid by praise of friends or abuse of foe but it is a hurt to us when men of humble lives and unobtrusive service fall in our midst and we find ourselves deprived of the use of simple and sincere terms of affectionate testimony tom maguire is one of these and the very marvel of the delightfulness of his personality compels expressions of love and sorrow from his comrades which to those who did not know him may seem unfittingly extravagant and superlative he was one of those men of whom we seldom meet more than one in a lifetime who possess that indefinable charm of friendship that suffers not by passing through the furnace heat or killing cold of life's vicissitudes one of those whose contact with their fellows seems exquisitely adjusted as by a secret art of life in no wise a saint marred indeed with faults and weaknesses that from the beginning have maimed the effectiveness of the more generous and sensitive spirits of the race he was nevertheless beloved wholeheartedly beloved of his friends a merit that saints have seldom or never attained his writings possess two great qualities of interest the first their real excellence of poetical and dramatic accomplishment not truly of the highest order of poetry but of that kind which is almost rarer which obtains for us spontaneous thoroughly expert and vivid transcription of unconstrained thought and emotion the second the emanation or fragrance which they yield of the rare gentleness and ever soothing charity and kindliness of humour which he possessed and which is perhaps one of the highest gifts which civilization has yet given to the hearts and heads of men the present little collection of machine room chants which he compiled for publication immediately before his death by no means exhibit the full variety of his powers their poetical merit the freshness of light truthfulness of feeling and effortless song which he imparts to subjects of everyday factory life will not however be denied by those who have a right to pronounce an opinion barbara and the old order changeth are masterpieces of their kind it is to be hoped that some day a more complete volume will be published containing a collection of his songs humorous pieces and political squibs of the latter many of which were written against time for the cartoons of the labour leader there are some which have not been excelled for humour happiness of phrase and tunefulness of verse in the literature of our time but we must not overburden this little book with other words than his own it will i am sure be gladly preserved in many a socialist home as a memento of one of the earliest and youngest of our street corner agitators and one of the last but gentlest and best of the old race of genuine wayfaring bards j bruce glazier end of section 0
Barbara by Tom Maguire, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. The firm gave us a holiday, our fines made up expenses, for railway fare, for breakfast, and for tea. And hadn't we a jolly day? We took leave of our senses, and laughed and carried on like mad at Scarborough by the sea. And oh, the sea was new to me, at Scarborough, at Scarborough, a shining and a shimmering through a veil of misty grey. Its face was fair, but ah, its lips were fringed with foam at Scarborough, that curled about my feet in scorn and spattered me with spray. We rolled about on donkeys' backs and slipped and kicked and shouted, we heard the nigger minstrels joke and sing. We bought a lot of cheap knick-knacks and dodged the men who touted for photos, fish, and carriage rides and almost everything. And still the sea looked strange to me at Scarborough, at Scarborough. I climbed up Castle Hill and saw it stretching miles away. But sooner all alone I'd be then I would be with Barbara, who beckoned from a pleasure boat that sailed within the bay. Oh, Barbara was beautiful and light and bright and jolly, yet generous and kind of heart was she, while I was only plain and dull and mostly melancholy. So Barbara a favourite with the foreman used to be. And though the sea looked wild to me at Scarborough, at Scarborough, a creepy, shiny monster twisting sideways, up and down, yet sooner in the sea I'd be than walk along with Barbara, lightly gallivanting with the four men round the town. We started in the morning when the four men flourished bottles, and gaily passed the liquor round and round. They occupied the time like men, attending to their throttles, who were not really happy till their wits were nearly drowned. And fast and free, in giddy glee, at Scarborough, at Scarborough, the foremen and their favourites went jigging up and down, for they were out upon the spree, and they had taken Barbara to treat her and bewilder her and show her round the town. We set off home by nine that night. The men were drunk and rowdy. We girls were all dog-tired and sore-tried. The favourites were a sorry sight. They all looked flushed and dowdy. Save Barbara, so pale and scared, who sat down by my side. And oh, the sea came back to me, the restless sea of Scarborough, when, looking in her ghastly face, I saw her troubled eyes. Are you ill or like to be, and what's amiss, dear Barbara? But Barbara said nothing, so I held my peace likewise. And not a word did Barbara say, till months had followed after. We wondered what was preying on her mind, for she who once was light and gay had lost her life and laughter in Scarborough on our outing day and left them there behind. And though the sea, the mocking sea, is treacherous at Scarborough, and cold as winter's clammy winds that death delights to fan, yet sooner in its livid waves I'd look for pity, Barbara, than seek it in the muddy heart of lust-begotten man. Barbara took a holiday. A letter came next morning from Scarborough, a black line round the rim. It told of her who'd passed away, from reach of human scorning, with never a hint concerning the identity of him. 
and oh the sea the wild blue sea holds barbara hides barbara and shields her in its shadow from the glances of the sun the mermaids chant her r.i.p she lost her soul in scarborough and cast away her body where her sorrow was begun end of poem this recording is in the public domain Unspoken Confidences by Tom Maguire Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Not Known of the Lady Visitor Oh, I am tired of factory life, Tired, tired as you would be. I fain would be a rich man's wife, Or any man's wife but a poor man's wife, For I am sick of the worry and strife, as you would be if you were me. My eyes are saddened, they once were bright, bright, bright as yours, lady. My hopes are heavy that once were light, and I grow weary and worn and white, weary of fading before men's sight, and worn by the hateful thought, maybe. Why do I shrink from a poor wife's lot? Why, why do you ask, lady? Oh, I have lived in the humble cot, And know the fears and the cares that rot the heart, Until even hope's forgot In the dismal round of drudgery. Drear is the lot of the poor man's spouse, Drear, drear and dull, lady. A prison cell is the poor man's house, and what of the rights the law allows? There is no rest for the poor man's spouse. There are no rights for such as she. The factory air is rank and close. Close, close, it stifles me. The foreman comes and the foreman goes. We shrink beneath the look he throws. But out in the street the cool wind blows. Sweet and cool are the streets, lady. The breath of the grave has damped my brow. Cold, cold and moist, lady. Cold is the breath of the grave on my brow. And nearer and nearer to earth I bow. Yet life seemed never so fair as now. Never so fair was the world to me. Alas! That sin is the world's elect, sin, sin, and shame, lady. While purse-proud virtue stalks erect, so boldly, brazenly circumspect, that lowly virtue, in tatters decked, shames in the sight of the Pharisee. Tis but a step to the streets, and the roar of life, life, mad life, lady. Only a step from the factory door, for a brief, brief span, and but one step more to the sullen river when all is o'er, and there is an end to my shadow and me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Minotaur by Tom Maguire, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Here in the heart of the cloud-wrapped town, where strong men thrive upon weak men down, where trade prepares its rank soul for hell, oh, here, along with the damned I dwell, and maidens are brought from near and far, to sate the lust of the minotaur. I pray on your budding womanhood, And drain the colour of life from her blood. I scale her skin till tis yellow and dry, And dim the lustre that lighted her eye. The marrow out of her bones I draw, Her breasts I grip with a cancerous claw, 
her husk in the end to the dogs i fling a bloodless soulless sexless thing cholera rags diphtherical tags are bundled to england in bales and bags worn out stockings and socks and pants shirts and bodices blouses from france cast-off singlets and derelict rugs the whole lot seething with alien bugs in short all where that has reached its last level is forwarded yorkshire via leeds to the devil the rags are cast in the devil's wide maw he tears them to tatters with steel tooth and claw from tatters he rends them asunder to shreds till nothing remains but manure and fine threads a few stray hairs from ability's skull are mixed with the mass in lieu of sheep's wool to act as straw axe in the making of bricks whereon it is sized until somehow it sticks then died in the water of rivers whose stink can be palpably felt twenty yards from the brink and thus are the sheddings of every poor body reclaimed from the gutter and made into shoddy fast and faster flies the machine threading the soapy seam binding the ends of a cloth unclean hark to its steely scream all the hope of your womanhood crossed by a fateful star all that is best of her pure heart's blood sapped by the minotaur stuffy and foul the workroom reeks with shoddy fumes and breath breath that tells of disease and speaks of a silent creeping death clothes are cheap in the world today cheaper the women are and mournfully they their tribute pay to the factory minotaur as rags to the devil your maidens to me are thrown with the curse on them and out of the mouth of the brick castile with clatter of shuttle and rattle of wheel shrills the wild requiem and the poor blind souls grope into the night and gather in mists afar they list to the shriek that follows their flight from the blood-fed minotaur end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Duchess of Number Three by Tom Maguire. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Ahem, you may look, but don't touch me, pray. Her walk, her style, and bearing say, No common trash about me, you see. For I don't work for my living like you. My paws are thinger me in the prue. I could stay at home if I chose to do says the duchess of number three if i work for less it's my own concern i dress myself with the money i earn it wouldn't find bread and tea for me but when lady visitors on us drop they come to me and beside me stop and so i give a high tone to the shop says the duchess of number three trade unions are vulgar and low my paw has frequently told me so they don't catch hold of men thy d and they are vulgar and low things who believe in such and support them too i'd tell their names if i only knew says the duchess of number three it's stuff and nonsense for girls to spose the firm can supply them with food and clothes when bad times chance to be says she my paw thinks if folk practised thrift on next to nothing they might make shift till providence gave commerce a lift 
says the Duchess of Number Three. They say I am cutting the other girls out who work for their bread and tea. No doubt. But thank you, England's free, tee hee. I will do as I like as long as I dare. What's fair to me is my own affair. And I'll please myself anyhow. So there, says the Duchess of Number Three. And the number three department girls, they copy her hat and the cut of her curls. Tis a touching sight to see, dear me. Her slightest word is their sacred law. They run her errands and stand her jaw, content to find neither fault nor flaw in the Duchess of Number Three. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Novelette Reader by Tom Maguire Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Tell me a tale and I'll hear with ears alert And heart as well Yet it must be a tale of life, high life My thirst to wet Not a story of hopeless toil For that is my daily lot Read me the loves of high-born dames, and, wrapped in their loves, I'll heed. Then will I laugh and cry with them for love of their hero-men. So through shrubbery, park, and wood, in fancy I shall go. All the din of the singer-machine forgotten by me, its thrall. Bread and tea and the foreman, and the early morning call. For it's tea and bread in the morning, bread and tea at noon, Waiting wearily all day long, singing drearily snatches of song, Praying for work in the morning, begging the precious boon, Till night comes down on my aching eyes, and not too soon. Lord, how I loathe the guardian who plots against his ward, Great as I hate the villain, marked to fall at the hands of fate. Pure is the lovely heroine, of origin obscure. He is noble who wins her, she an heiress proves to be. Lo, the thought springs into my head, and what if I were? But no, wild hope laughs at a thought of the thought, for I am a nobody's child. To my story of sorrow and love I turn and weep anew, Until all things come right in the end, As, at least, in tales they do. Tea and bread in the morning, Bread and tea at noon, Locked outside of the workhouse gate, Fined for being too late to wait, For work in the early morning, Real life is a doleful tune till night clouds over another dead day, and not too soon. Nay, it's not lies in a novelette that leads work girls astray, but the hard-faced fact of a life in one long joyless rut, while youth flies on the wing and dies with a sickly, mocking smile, and the curse of a toil-crossed life is all that is left on hand, Cold is the winter morning, the cough has a deeper hold, dearth of work and no wages, with home a hell upon earth, brain and body wasting away. God, what a cruel toll a woman pays to mammon in the hope of saving her soul. Tea and bread in the morning, bread and tea at noon, breathing a poisoned atmosphere, Till eyes grow leaden and face grows sear, Facing the sleet in the morning, Dizzy and alike to swoon, Till death comes down from a merciful God, And not too soon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Singer Machine by Tom Maguire Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist Little Ellen came to me, fresh out of the country, Came and sat before me in her common home-cut gown, Said she meant to master me, said it with effrontery, Laughed I at her timid touch as the child sat down. Pink cheeks in the country, chalk cheeks in the town, Ellen's were carnation where they were not russet brown. Oh, the health and promise there, coming from the country, Has she touched my shoulder on the morning she sat down. Soon we grew to bosom friends, at her touch I yielded, Picking natty stitches with a straight, unbroken thread, Answering her every thought, even as my wheel did, Flying at the pressure of her tiny-footed tread. Pink cheeks from the country, shining on me down, Wondering at her white-faced mates who bore the stamp of town, Trembling at their heedless jibes, coming from the country, Praying that her face and hands were white instead of brown. Little Ellen murmured low, Oh, my heart afraid is, And I felt a teardrop touch my face of burnished steel, For on either hand of her worked the finest ladies, Languid, pale, and thin, and worn, and every way genteel. Pink face from the country, puckered in a frown, Pained by every small remark reflecting on her gown. Sweet young body, fresh and fair, coming from the country, Drinking in the humours of the foul, polluted town. Little Ellen, if I could, thus I would make answer. Fear not that your face is brown, time shall bleach it yet. On your left consumption sits, on your right sits cancer. White disease has blown its breath on all yon bloodless set. Pink cheeks in the country, chalk cheeks in the town. Ellen's deep carnation yet shall merge itself in brown. Brown shall change to livid grey, all that speaks the country. Soon shall disappear, my dear, and to the worms go down. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Feller Hand by Tom Maguire. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. If you please, sir, I can't help it. I'm only a feller hand, and low wages means low living, as perhaps you'll understand. Six shillings was the biggest weekly wage I ever drew, but I have to live on less than that, and how do you think I do? If I could earn six shillings every week all through the year, do you think I'd stand a shiverin' and talkin' to you here? But half of it's more like what with slack and no time too, and I've got to make the best of it, the best that I can do. For I haven't no relations to fall back upon, like some, and I've nothing in the bank put by to draw when hard times come, and I've got to dress respectable and pay my way like you, and live somehow besides, sir, as a woman wants to do. No, I wouldn't like to die, sir, for I think the good Lord's hard on us common workin' women, and the like o' me's debarred from his high, uncertain heaven, where fine ladies all go to. So I try to keep on livin', though the Lord knows how I do. I wonder and I wonder, as I sometimes sit and sew, if lady callers take us for a sort of waxwork show, 
and what they'd say about us if one half the truth they knew and whether they would manage any better than we do but the good lord isn't merciful for some are born to hell while some are born to heaven here and afterwards as well and good people are so cruel and kind people oh so few and the world goes to the devil as it cannot help but do good night sir if you're going thanks you don't give no advice what i want is food and clothing which is mostly virtue's price at least it seems to me so though i'm but a poor wretch who has tried her best and worst to live and found it hard to do end of poem this recording is in the public domain for a living by tom maguire read for LibriVox.org by newgate novelist youth and beauty pity ruth love and all that soars above brute existence low and mute man is giving for a living tis for this he justifies his soul's hopeless sacrifice this the burden of his sighs for a living round the piteous phrase are found broken hearts and hopes unspoken and the humans all unmanned sink below the brute brink shrinking from heroic death drinking in a poisoned breath for a living all things giving and a brutish life receiving christ is hourly sacrificed in cant consecrated sin by false teachers trained to lie for a living the lie giving while the traders versed in guile pile the rich reward of wile smile and leer like strumpets vile for a living cursed at birth and famine nursed hollow-eyed the women follow life that mocks with endless strife crowned with but the grave mound trooping to the streets in crowds drooping maids seek harlot shrouds for a living virtue giving and a speedy death receiving end of poem this recording is in the public domain the old order changeth by tom maguire read for LibriVox.org by newgate novelist Was the doctor from the hospital, Jane, the old man slowly said. The wife looked up at her husband, and again she bowed her head. The doctor's been, and he talked to me, and he says she's dying there. In number one ward, first turn to the right, at the top of the hospital stair. And the doctor, he asked would we see her, Jane, and I says in his keen face, no. And he called me a harsh old fool, he did, and I liked him to take on so. Till he talked us to put the blame on me, for the loose way Letty had gone. But twas dancin' that did it, dancin', I say. And of course it was dancin', John. I told him as how we brought her up, and he listened as if he knew, and how she had school and mourn a bit, and he just says, quite right, too. How I planted the fear o' God in her with the rod when there was need, as my father had done with me, Jane, and the doctor, says he, indeed. Then I told him about her going to work, at the new-fangled sewing machine and her picking up with some smart work mates and dressing up like a queen and her singing and larkin and chassian and such like carryings on but twas dancing i blame for it dancing jane and indeed it was dancing john i went on to say i had warned her and was going to stand no more of her staying out late at parties 
than as how I would bolt the door at ten o' night in the future, which it afterwards came about. That she landed home at a quarter past time and found herself locked out. And I mentioned how she had rapped and knocked and cried out to me and you to let her in for the love o' God which you, woman-like, wanted to do. And the doctor, he walked about the room, and his eyes, they fairly shone. But t'was dancin' that started it, that's what I say. Yes, yes, it was dancin', John. The doctor, he asked what happened then, and I says she went sobbin' away, while we laid awake all through the night, and waited all through the day, expectin her back repentant, and willin to take the blame, for breakin the fourth commandment, but the hussy she never came. Then I told him how you fell ill, Jane, and about the oath I swore, to let her go her own road to the dogs, and to speak of her never no more and how I took off my hat as I did, with my hand the old book on, and cursed all their academy dancing. And but what did he say, John? Well, the doctor, he eyed me curious-like, then he suddenly ups and outs, with oath as big as a bargee's fist, and he turns on me and shouts, You would drive a saint to the devil, you would, with your damned old Puritan ways. It isn't me that's a swearin', Jane, the blame on the doctor lays. You and your rod and your ten o'clock, we'd still have the curfew bell, if we all did just as our fathers, he says. And the wild way he went on, when t'was dancin' that did it, not me at all. And, well, maybe t'was dancin', John. He quieted down in a while, and says, I'm sorry I spoke so strong, But it's well meant, misplaced acts like yours That make for so much wrong. When girls go into the factory, They are drilled and driven and tried, And they want some relaxation away From their own fireside. It's too much to ask of a woman, pent up all day in the shop, to take on the duties of home besides, and forever at home to stop. The world is wider to her than it was to our mothers in times bygone. And dancin's all right in itself, says he. And perhaps he was right too, John. You never mind that. What he says is this. The woman who earns her bread is a lot more independent than the one who lives to get wed, and she's safe enough to be trusted for to keep from coming to grief, but it's doubting and crying down all she does that plays the most mischief. Most that is bad is bad because good dull folk will have it so. And souls are sent to perdition sometimes when the godly whisper low, where never a wrongful thing was done, and wrong thought there was none. The doctor, he says, looking fierce at me, and God bless him for speaking, John. And he says she was under the ether, for they had to cut her deep, for a deadly spreadin' cancer, Jane and she dropped some words in her sleep, and talked about us, the doctor says, in such a heart-broken way, that he waited until she came to herself to hear what she would say. And she's dying, and longing to see us, Jane, her husband being dead. There isn't a friend but the doctor to sit by our poor child's bed, and it's number one ward. Are we going, Jane, before our Letty is gone? The old wife's heart gushed into her eyes, 
and thank heaven we'll go now, John. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Underpaid Agitator by Tom Maguire Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist It's cruel to cut things so fine It's strange that the girls will not learn To fall into line And boldly combine To keep up the wages they earn The slightest reduction It drives and goads us And sweats us the more since all of us strive, and some may contrive, to earn just as much as before. And first when I entered the work girls' union, I put it to Sarah Ann Lee. But she laughed in my face and called me a loonian. No union but marriage for me, says she. It's shameful to put us on peace and fine us at times if we're late when the work in the shop has come to a stop and there's nothing to do but to wait and it's worse to be fined for a stitch that a minute or two would set right but they drop on us hot if a fault they can spot and as often as not out of spite and i put it to sarah ann lee that the union said fine such as them shouldn't be. But she snapped and declared I was always a moonian. The tight marriage union for me, says she. She married, did Sarah Ann Lee. He wasn't a duke or an earl, but a commonplace chap with his head full of sap and the hair of it nicely in curl. They had a full week's honeymoon, and then she came back to her place, for the chap she had wed didn't earn much, she said, on account of his very young face. But she cared for him more than she cared for the union, and therefore I let her a be. She fancied I wasn't cut out for a spoonian, like poor unfortunate me, laughed she. She went home one day to her bed. Dread was the disease that she bore, and she lay as one dead. Her husband had fled to return to her side nevermore. We tended her and nursed her for weeks, but her poor broken spirit was spent and the most we could do was to see her pull through before to the workhouse she went. But poor Sarah Ann wasn't long for the union, not long for the world was she. She died of the birth of her babe, a still punian. The union buried them free. Ah, oh, me! The story is common, God knows. Too common, maybe, for to tell, but the work-girl wife still toils for dear life and attends to her homework as well. And blind and blinder than eyeless owls, we bend to our slavish lot and pile up the wrong till our prince comes along when we go arm in arm straight to pot. You proud women snobs, who sneer at the union, what fools in your hearts are ye? Vain, self-loving slaves, you are bidding for graves, like that which holds Sarah Ann Lee rent-free. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Watches of the Night by Tom Maguire Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist I had waited, mutely waited, unmarried and unmated, Till my very soul and senses had grown dumb. And I wondered if the bride, 
I had dreamt of in my pride would from out the murky, dusty, hidden future ever come. But she's coming, coming, I hear the fife and drumming, heralding her happy way. She's coming, coming, the air around is humming, with the music of the silvery feet of socialism coming. Oh, the wide outlook was dreary, and my eyes were tired and weary, for my hopes were burnt to ashes cold and white. My heart was sick and faint, and I felt the deadly taint of the dull despair that hovers round the watches of the night. But she's coming, coming, I hear the fife and drumming, heralding the happy way, turning night to light and day. She's coming, coming, the air around is humming, with the music of the silvery feet of socialism coming. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. And end of Machine Room Chants by Tom Maguire. Thank you for listening.